there's recently been a report from the National Audit Office uh, criticizing the British government's preparations for Brexit or the completion of Brexit at the end of the transition period on the 31st of December of this year. Uh, the criticism has been that uh, foreseeable uh, problems which will arise from Britain's leaving the customs union and the internal market have not been properly or not been um, promptly addressed by the British government. I'm sure that criticism is justified, but I want to argue um, in this podcast um, that such um, administrative in inadequacy and lack of foresight um, are at the heart of Brexit. It's not possible to have a Brexit that's uh, e uh, administratively um, uh, smoothly carried out, um, confusion and delusion and mistaken uh, policies uh, are at the heart of it. If we go back to the um, Leave campaign itself, of course, uh, we see two very central factors militating against administrative clarity. Uh, one of which was the denunciation of experts. Um, the um, Brexit project was always from the beginning, uh, a denunciation and renunciation uh, of people who knew through their professional or business experience, um, the way in which administrative um, procedures should and did work. It was an exercise of the will contrasted with, uh, with the facts um, as presented by experts. The second factor for unclarity was, of course, the, the vagueness about what Brexit meant. Uh, Brexit, meant bre Brexit means Brexit was a phrase of Theresa May's specifically designed to cover the fact that there were quite different views of what Brexit meant. In early 2017, this question of what Brexit meant was largely resolved when Mrs May's government decided that it should mean that Britain left the internal market and left the customs union. At that point, um, a reasonable, rational and administratively coherent government should have mounted a major effort to inform business and to make the preparations necessary for dealing with the inevitable consequences of this traumatic split from the European Union. Leave aside whether it was politically the right decision for Theresa May to take. It was one that had economic and trading consequences that ought to have been prepared for, and they weren't. I think there were a number of reasons why this was so, and they go to the heart of the Brexit project. The first um, reason, was in the psychology of the Leave referendum winners um, who constituted so large a component uh, of the British government from 2016. Their view was that they had got where they wanted to be, which was ripping Britain out of the European Union um, by a, a laser-like focus um, on their arguments, on their rhetoric, on their analysis. They were not going to allow themselves to be backtracked, be sidetracked um, by facts, by inconvenient um, complaints from business, from academia, or from the professions. Um, they were going to put their heads down and run against the brick wall because they thought that that was the way that the Battle of Britain had been won. That's the way that the Eton Wall game is won these days. If you show that you're aware of the problems of the project, then that can only be an advantage to the other side with whom you're negotiating. I think it was genuine thought throughout 2017, 18 and 19, um, that if Britain showed itself too aware of the problems arising from Brexit and the sort of Brexit it had chosen to implement, then that would be of an advantage to um, our negotiating partners in the EU. Uh, unfortunately, the EU knew perfectly well what the situation was. They were experienced negotiators and they didn't allow themselves to be put off um, by what they regarded as uh, an unnecessary assumption uh, of superiority uh, and, uh, and ease um, of negotiation coming from the British side. There was also a more cynical and more understandable uh, aspect of this um, uh, mindset as well. Uh, I mentioned that the Leave referendum people um, were very much at the heart of the Conservative government. And it would have been extremely embarrassing for them um, to, to admit implicitly over 2017, 18 and 19, by making preparations to mitigate the problems of Bre Brexit, that those problems indeed existed and have been conjured up by the decision for Brexit and the kind of Brexit they wanted, which they themselves had, had advocated. Um, so I can understand why there was a reluctance on the part of the British government to advertise um, the inevitable, and I stress inevitable consequences for trade and the economy of Britain's leaving the customs union and the internal market. 
these consequences will come into being independently of whether there is a deal or no deal um, at the, the end of, of this year. When we got to 2020 um, and Britain had left the European Union and the transition period began, uh, the British government began very tentatively and very reluctantly um, to talk a bit uh, about the uh, necessity for changes and preparations uh, in the light of, of a coming uh, uh, end of the transition period. Uh, rhetoric they employed was always and has always been uh, evasive and ambiguous. Uh, they talk about challenges, they talk about changes that are coming. Um, they even, and most egregiously, um, talk about investment in the customs services. Uh, this against the background of lorry parks of sexual anxieties and particularly uh, unease in, in Northern Ireland of what the end of the transition period will, 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 will mean. Uh, the implausibility and the um, uh, unconvincingness of this rhetoric, I'm afraid it's underlined by the, the mediocrity of some of the ministers who are sent out to defend it. And that all also is an intrinsic element of Brexit. Um, um, independent, free-thinking um, conservatives have been winnowed out of today's Conservative Party if they expressed any doubt uh, about the validity or viability of the Brexit pro project. Um, mediocrity of ministers and overconfident special advisers um, give the tone of the day um, in this pr present British government. We've seen it, sad to say, in the COVID preparations and the attempts to, to combat COVID and we're seeing it as well in, in the preparations for, for Brexit or the completion of Brexit by the end of the transition. Uh, personally, um, I'm not sure that Boris Johnson knows uh, whether he wants a deal or no deal. I'm clear that he wants to have a deal on his terms, but he's not sure what he'll do as it becomes um, uh, unavoidably clear um, that they aren't to be, that no deal is to be had on his terms. I was very struck by the way in which the presidential election in the United States was cited as a reason for postponing a decision. Uh, I don't think that that was a particularly plausible account. Uh, after all, Donald Trump was never going to bail out Brexit, Brexit Britain. And apart from his interest in the Irish um, aspect of the withdrawal agreement, um, I don't think that Joe Biden um, has very high on his list of priorities um, concerning himself with Brexit. I think the waiting until the presidential election was over was simply a pretext for Boris Johnson to postpone uh, an uncongenial decision in which there are no good options available to him. No deal will be politically very, very difficult to him um, because he wants to be able um, to t say to his backbenchers um, that he's uh, fought the good fight, that he hasn't compromised with the European Union. But on the other hand, he knows that economically there's a price to be paid for no deal. Uh, I think in any case, um, he wants to be able, and that's one reason why he hasn't been stressing the economic difficulties uh, arising at the beginning of next year, he wants to be able to blame the European Union uh, for supposed intransigence in causing these economic difficulties. That's been part of the communication strategy of the um, British government uh, over the past uh, four years. It's tried to normalize the idea that somehow it can escape from the consequences of the customs union and the internal market. When Boris Johnson makes his decision, um, I'm afraid it won't be a decision um, which is a, a maturely and carefully reflected one. It's much more likely to be um, have the same characteristics as many of the decisions of this government have been taken in haste, uh, repented of, modified, changed again, and then finally um, the decision is taken, um, uh, which perhaps should have been taken a long time ago and in less favourable circumstances. We all have in mind um, Sir Humphrey Appleby's remark in Yes Minister to his ministerial boss, um, if you must do this damn silly thing, Minister, don't do it in this damn silly way. My argument has been that um, Brexit is indeed a damn silly thing, but it has to be done in a damn silly way. We've seen from opinion polls that more and more people now realise uh, that Brexit itself is a damn silly idea. Uh, I think that over the coming months, more and more people is, will come to realise that it's being carried out in a damn silly way, and perhaps it was inevitable. I would say it definitely was inevitable that it should be carried out in such a damn silly way because there's no other way of carrying it out.